Hello and welcome to SNI. I am Surya Gangadhar. Uh, as you are aware, in the last few days, there have been uh, two attacks on Saudi oil facilities, uh, apparently by drones from uh, Iran. That is a claim made by the Americans. The Houthis of Yemen have claimed that the drone attacks were theirs. So there's a bit of confusion over there. But uh, what is germane here is the fact that uh, oil prices have gone up by around 20% from what we uh, read in the, in, the, in the local media. I have with me Mr. Talmiz Ahmed. Uh, he was India's ambassador to Saudi Arabia and closely follows the oil politics and other politics of that region. Uh, sir, welcome to this interview. Um, what is your reading of the way this entire, uh, uh, this entire incident has evolved and the accusations being traded? I think this is a matter of very great concern for all of us. Uh, this attack has three dimensions, a military dimension, a political dimension, as well as an energy dimension. In, in military terms, it is a serious escalation. The Houthis have indicated that they will dispute with the Saudis the command of the air wave, you know, air space above the Arabian Peninsula. They have inflicted considerable damage on the Saudis and their facilities. In terms of the energy side, uh, the Saudis have been compelled to curtail their production. And obviously, are, I mean, you know, in the early period of this day, there was a massive increase in oil prices, which has a serious impact on the global energy scenario. Thirdly, the Americans have decided to escalate matters as far as Iran is concerned. And they have blamed Iran on the basis of no evidence that they have offered. They have blamed Iran for this attack. As far as India is concerned, we have every reason to be extremely concerned. Uh, we are not only dependent on petroleum on Saudi Arabia, but we get about 80% of our oil from the Gulf region as a whole. And obviously that is a matter of concern for us in case there is a region-wide conflict. We also have to worry about American foreign policy. The Americans had earlier indicated that they might be de-escalating. After Trump had sacked uh, you know, John Bolton, there were, there were indications from the American side that they might, be, uh, they might be preparing the ground for a dialogue. And there was even indication from American sources that there might be an easing of sanctions, even to the extent of about $15 billion. So the outlook was very positive. It is surprising that within a few days of this de-escalation, uh, Pompeo has thought of escalating matters with the Iranians so rapidly. It indicates that he has now assumed the mantle of the ultra hawk in the U.S. administration. Whether he will succeed or not, and whether he will continue to escalate matters, that is something we have to watch very carefully. We have every reason to be extremely concerned about the situation as a whole. So let's just look at the military aspect first. Uh, for the um, Houthis to be able to uh, send drones into Saudi airspace, it tells us that the Saudi military is either not alert or they are poorly equipped in terms of air defense. What do you read? Uh, yes, it is a surprising development that they could not intercept these drones across the Arabian Peninsula. Do recall here that uh, in the month of June, the American drone had intruded into Iranian airspace and it was brought down immediately. So it is a bit worrying, it's a bit surprising that the Saudis were not able to bring it down. Also, do you recall that the Americans have a very robust military presence in the region and they could not detect this either. Also, we have to be concerned about, besides the sophistication of the drones, we have to be concerned about the distance that they could travel. It is now said in the U.S. media that possibly the Houthis have drones uh, that have a range of 1,500 kilometers. So I think that, and they have also said uh, that they will be inflicting a more wide and uh, more painful attacks on the Saudis. Do recall here that the Saudis have for the last four years been attacking Yemen. About 100,000 yeah. people are dead. Almost all the major cities are destroyed. And uh, there is a very serious humanitarian disaster facing the country. Now the Houthi has finally indicated that he will not take all this lying down and he is going to inflict very serious damage on his enemies. Who is giving 
giving these drones to uh, the Houthis at the end of the day, the Houthis are a non-state actor, and this has serious implications even for our even for us. Uh, there is no one who has indicated that the drones came from outside the country. You know that Yemen has been a highly militarized uh, state and a very loosely governed state. It is awash with weaponry. Uh, they have been using drones, as you know, for the last several years, and they have been attacking uh, Saudi targets. These targets were till recently fairly close by. But in the last year, they had gone further afield and had gone even to targets which were about 500 and 600 kilometers away. This is a further escalation in this regard. Uh, according to various American sources, possibly the drone technology has been developed by the Houthis on their own. Yes, we all did think that they are a ragtag group and a ragtag militia, but obviously they are much more sophisticated than we had imagined. Also do recall that in spite of the massive attacks upon them over the last four years, they still control the major cities. And the Saudis have not been able to dislodge them from Taiz, Hudaida, and Sana. So they've given a good account of themselves as far as the fighting is concerned. And now, obviously, they've taken the fighting to a new, much more dangerous level. So clearly, Saudi military capabilities are suspect. Now, this is getting on to the business of oil, sir. Um, how is India to look at this since we source much of our oil from Saudi Arabia? From the Gulf, actually, and we no longer are able to buy oil from Iran or Venezuela. I think, with regard to the immediate concern, I would suggest that there is enough oil available readily, and India and most of the international community can meet their needs. There are large stockpiles of oil within Saudi Arabia itself. Uh, Saudi Arabia itself has uh, strategic storage in three or four major areas in Egypt and Japan as well as uh, uh, in Vietnam, in Singapore or Vietnam. So in Southeast Asia, in the Mediterranean and in Japan, it is, I think, already well stocked. Similarly, with regard to the rest of the international community, uh, with regard to the other suppliers, I think there is enough oil available. Americans have also indicated that they might release their reserves in order to stabilize prices. And prices have indicated a certain easing already. It is the medium term that we have to be worried about. Conflicts in the in West Asia have gone on now for eight years. There is no viable peace process. Hundreds of thousands of people have been killed. Entire societies and nations have been devastated. There is a visceral animosity between Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Iran. And of course, the whole situation is complicated by the interventions of the Americans on the one hand and the Israelis on the other. The region is desperately looking for a viable peace process. I have argued in the past, and I will assert this again, India has crucial interest, abiding interest, in regional security and in regional stability. We have long-term interest. We have interest relating to energy, of course, uh, as also in terms of our trade and investment. We have a community of 8.5 million people. We have connectivity projects through Tehran. I mean, uh, the true the, the true Iran. We have such enormous stakes. I believe that this is a golden opportunity for us. It is indeed overdue that India should lead a peace process in the region. It should, uh, it should engage with the principal parties. And I think that this is something that is viable. It is something that is credible. And also it is something that is seriously overdue. Is this something the Saudis could accept? Because uh, they have a huge, huge American, uh, you know, uh, outlook, and uh, even Iran, for that matter, uh, I'm told they are a little upset because we've stopped uh, buying oil from them, and activity at Chabahar is also down because we are again wary of American sanctions. You see, these are immediate responses to immediate problems. My perception is more long term. I believe that yes, there should be some initiative. There is no other peace initiative in the region. I am not suggesting that India yeah. should act alone. India should mobilize other Asian countries that are similarly concerned like China, Japan and Korea and possibly even Russia. Uh, these are all countries that have a lot of credibility in the region. 
yes, the Saudis are concerned about the situation and they have so far depended on the American, but they have got nowhere. The Americans are not willing to engage the Iranians militarily as of now. Uh, they are interested more in defense supplies. And as far as Syria and Yemen are concerned, there has been no headway whatsoever militarily on the ground. Again, with regard to the Iranian side, yes, they are concerned and they have signaled to us their concern uh, that, they, that they wanted India to play a more active role as far as engaging Iran is concerned in this difficult time. And it is possibly in this background that the Foreign Secretary is visiting Iran even as we speak. So I think the level of engagement has continued. I think our commitment to relations with the Iranians has also continued. My suggestion is with regard to a behind-the-scenes diplomatic initiative, possibly through the National Security Advisor. I think it should have been done a long time ago, but even if it wasn't done for various domestic reasons, this is something that we can look at. I'm not promising success, but unless we make the effort, we will go nowhere. Let us try. Let us engage with the principal countries of the region, see what we can do in the immediate uh, uh, aftermath of this attack. Possibly we can work towards ceasefires in Yemen and in Syria. And once we have the ceasefire in place, we can provide immediate humanitarian assistance. And after that, start looking at the larger regional issues, which will take some more time. And we can organize into this effort various other role players in the effort as well. The effort has to be made. This region is much too sensitive, much too close to us, and we are much too dependent on it for it to be left to the vagaries of the White House. The, the Americans have played a generally very non-responsible and a very aggressive role. They have worsened the ground situation repeatedly by their hostile actions and by the actions of their lobbies that seem to carry so much influence with the, with the Trump administration. Even I sometimes think that Trump is not interested in conflict but he has people around him who are egging him on. And I personally feel that Pompeo may be one of them now, that he is the one who, on the basis of no information, should have intervened in this discussion and categorically stated it is Iran. This is something they had done earlier also in May and June, when the tankers had been attacked, on the basis of no evidence. So this is the kind of, uh, uh, these are the kind of provocations that you get from sections of the U.S. administration who somehow seem to want to overturn the policies of their own president. Even now, because of Pompeo's intervention, uh, you know, Trump has announced that he is uh, ready and loaded and is now uh, looking for a fight. Thankfully, he has been cautious and he said he's consulting with the Saudis and it is on the basis of what the Saudis tell him that he may take further action. I think that the Saudis have been deliberately cautious in this regard. They don't want to escalate matters in the region. If there is conflict, it won't be the Americans who will be hurt. It will be the Saudis and the Emiratis, the Qataris and the Kuwaitis. Absolutely. So in the event there is a strike of some kind by the Americans on Iran, uh, um, how will it spread? I mean, how do you, what form could it take? Because on the one hand, Trump is talking of a meeting with the, the Iranian president at the UNGA. And in the event he carries out a strike of this kind, everything goes under. You see, the Americans for far too long have been speaking uh, with a folk tongue. Uh, they, they say something and then something else happens and they say something else. This has now gone on far too long. I think Trump's instincts are to avoid conflict. He has repeatedly said that regional power should take responsibility for regional security. And I agree with that. I believe that countries like India and China and Japan and Korea have a much larger and more immediate responsibility in regard to regional security. Uh, I don't think the, if there is, there is a push in certain sections of the, uh, of the U.S. administration that there should be a short, sharp attack. I am not able to figure out what and why. What short, sharp attack? On what, on whom, and for what purpose? You already have crippling sanctions in place. The, country, uh, the country's economy is in recession. 
is people are in serious, uh, they have serious health issues, serious economic issues, serious employment issues. What more do you want to achieve? And will it be achieved by a short, sharp attack? If you have any attack on the Iranians, it is a given that the Iranians will retaliate very robustly and it won't be a short, sharp attack. Yes. It will be a regional conflagration. So, uh, given the current scenario over the next couple of weeks, what do you expect will happen? Do you anticipate perhaps a peace move from within the region? Well, we, it's difficult to say what conclusions the American administration will draw. As you know, Trump had come close to uh, a conflict uh, sometime in mid-June when the American drone was shot down. At that time, I think he was finally convinced by people around him that it, their, their drone had actually and deliberately strayed into Iranian airspace. So shooting it down was not an irregular or illegal matter. And there, it is, I think, following this and other differences which have not yet come into the public domain that Bolton was finally dismissed. He is the one who had been provoking war for a very long time and the president realized that he was being manipulated. Now we have in Pompeo the uh, the final remnant of the hawk uh, of the ultra hawk scenario pompeo's commitment is to go for war is to go for conflict but i think that the president's instincts are against it my own feeling is and uh, i have no reason i have no hint from riyadh my feeling is that riyadh may be reluctant to go in for a major conflict at this point i don't think they would like to do that I think they are far too vulnerable. Recall here, for instance, that the UAE at the end of June sent two delegations to the Iranians because they and they also withdrew from the Yemen war. So I think that there is a pervasive view in the region that war is not good for us. If there is any conflict, we will be the first victims. We will be devastated. Imagine these small countries like uh, uh, the UAE or uh, Bahrain or Kuwait and large parts of Saudi Arabia, they are just across the Gulf water. If there is an attack uh, on Iran, I think the retaliation will be very harsh and it will come onto the uh, various facilities along the coast, uh, along the Arab coast. So I think this is something to be avoided. I personally hope that the Saudis can convince Donald Trump that the Iranians were not involved with this. This is something to do with the Houthis. And there, I think this should be a very good basis to see how we can initiate and solidify the peace process in Yemen on the first in, in the first instance, and then see how far we can go with regard to promoting bilateral relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I think this is something that we can do. This is something that we should be doing, even as I speak to you. Last question. Is this going to accelerate our move to diversify our sources away from the Gulf, perhaps America, perhaps Russia? Actually, this has been discussed several times in the past, but there is no way we can substitute supplies from the Gulf from any other source. Their prices are more reasonable, geographical proximity, the, the quantities are substantial, the geographical proximity is extremely significant. I don't think we can go to other sources. A far better thing to do would be to promote a peace process than go scurrying elsewhere. Also do recall, the energy market is a globally integrated market. Even if they, we try to shift supplies to somebody else, the prices are still going to be extremely high. The prices are global in character. And, uh, you know, so in, uh, I don't believe that any uh, interest will be served by shifting sources, even if that was viable, which it is not in my view. I think the priority now should be how we can do something to bring peace to this region that has seen conflict for so long. And Dr. Tamiz, on that note, thank you very much, sir, for your views. Thank you. I wish you all the best.